I'm George Wilson. I'm from Brisbane. I work for a cool company called EFOX in Brisbane. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you about what I've called the extended functor family. Uh, originally, this talk was going to be called Fun with Functors. It turns out that's a pretty popular name already. <laughs> so I had to pick a different one. Uh, and I guess the, the point of the talk, or the, the thing I'm trying to get across here, is that there's this whole beautiful hierarchy of all these different abstractions. Uh, and in fact, this isn't even the whole hierarchy. I just had to, I had to pick a bunch of them uh, to fit it on a slide. But we, we tend to focus a lot on this bit, right? How many times have you heard the word monad today? It's a fair few, right? We focus on functor applicative monad. Sometimes we get into alternative. And, these, and that's because these are really cool and come up all the time. Right, but I just wanted to kind of do a talk to show off some of these other ones that are less loved, uh, sort of in general, um, in the community. And to kind of give you some of these, uh, some of these branches that nice subtrees come off of. So let's do that. First, I'll start by talking about functors. Uh, quickly, can I get a show of hands who's familiar with Haskell syntax? Oh, that's lots of people. Awesome. All right. And who's familiar with Scala syntax? Yep, cool. All right. Uh, my slides are in Haskell because it's the only way to make it fit on the slide. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, really happy to, I'm really happy to go through any of this stuff in Scala. If you want to come and find me in the hallway afterwards or at the bar or whatever, I can bust out VI and enter in some Scala. Um, or come see me if you want Haskell stickers. I have a whole bunch of them. Uh, so let's talk about functor. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this is a type class definition for functor. It says that f is a functor if I can write this method fmap, which says, given a function from a to b and an f of a, produce an f of b. OK? And currently on this slide, there is no reason to care about this thing. But I will remedy this. There we go. It has laws. Now we can care about it. <laughs> All right, good. What are some examples of functors? Well, list is a functor, right? This is sort of the typical sort of canonical example people reach for, so I did. Uh, it says, given a function from A to B and a list of A's produce a list of B's. And it does that. If the list is empty, we return the empty list. If the list is not empty, it has a head and a tail. So we run the function f on the head and then cons that onto the recursive f map on the tail. And that'll take you from a list of a to a list of b, given that function. Maybe is another functor, so it's, it's either nothing or it's just x. So that's a functor where if it's nothing, we just give back nothing. Or if it's just x, we run the function over the x. Cool. So a functor is some sort of a, a, a containery or a context-y thing, or maybe an effect-y thing. Uh, as we've heard earlier, and we have some kind of a function, um, and so we can get a new box full of other different things. I was told I didn't have enough diagrams in this talk by a mentor of mine, um, and so I drew some poorly in MS Paint or whatever. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so let's talk about some other functors. This cryptic piece of syntax here says that paired with x is a functor. So the right-hand part of a tuple is, is, a, is a mappable thing, right? So given a function from A to B and a pair of an x and an a, I can break the tuple apart, run the function over the right-hand side, and put it back in a tuple. Fine. So we, could, we can map over the right half of a tuple. And we have a similar story with either, right? So if we, if we sort of fix the left-hand side of the either and say, well, that's going to stay as e, then we can f map over over the right-hand side. So if, the e, if the, we get a function and we have an either, if the either is left, it's still left. If it's right, we run the function over the x and wrap that back up in right. OK, so we can, we can map over the right, half, the right type parameter of these things with two type parameters. And that's kind of cool. So to go back to a horrible diagram, if we have some kind of box with differently colored things in, and we have a function from one of the things to some other thing, we can create a new box. And it has to have some of the same things, but we can run the function where we can. Uh, and that's not good enough, right? I hate these yellow circles. We want different things in this other box. 
We need to fix the yellow circle menace. So that's what bifunctor will do. Uh, so P is a bifunctor. If I can write a function by map, which says, given a function from A to B and a function from X to Y, and a P that has an A and an X, run those two functions and get a P of a B and a Y. OK, and it has, we can do either half of the mapping independently uh, with these two functions, first and second. And of course, I care about this, so it has laws. Um, well, that might be the wrong direction of the because, but. Yeah. Um, so now we can write a bifunctor instance for tuple, which says, I can map over both sides at once, or either one independently with those other two functions I showed you, and that's cool. Right? And the same with either, right? So if I have a function from A to B and a function from X to Y and an either AX, I can run those, I can produce an either BY by figuring out which side of the either it is and running the corresponding function. Okay? So this kind of looks like this. We can eliminate the the, the awful problem of having yellow circles and get blue rectangles instead if we'd like, and, and it sort of does this kind of thing. We, we have a box with two different kinds of stuff in it, and we can get a box with two other kinds of stuff in it. Hooray. Uh, let's move on. That's bifunctor. Let's talk about contravariant functors. So this is where things start getting turned up to 11 <laughs> and continue on through 13 and 14. Uh, I want to look at this type for a moment. This is a predicate. Uh, so this is a predicate on A's. So a predicate is a function which produces a Boolean as its result. And so a predicate on A's takes, uh, takes an A and produces a bool. And I ask you, can we write a functor instance for this thing? Right, so to write a functor instance, we'd have to write a law abiding F map. And that thing would have the type Function, give me a function from A to B and a predicate on A's, and I will produce a predicate on B's. Can we write this function? And the answer is no, we can't. It can't be done uh, because it, it, it's sort of the wrong, it's sort of the wrong intuition, right? When we have a, a predicate on A's doesn't have some A's. It's a thing that wants to consume some A's. It's like waiting for some A's to come in. Right. And so the kind of intuition of a functor, we might think of it as a container or a context or something, it kind of doesn't quite fit. But there is a functory sort of a thing that fits this, which we will come to shortly. But first I need to have a quick short diversion into terminology so that I can explain why that thing isn't a functor and why it is one of these other things. So I'm interested in a thing called polarity which refers to uh, the, the idea that a type in a type signature can be in either positive position or in negative position. So a type on its own is in positive position. So if we have, you know, an int or maybe whatever or a list of some stuff, that's in positive position. And function return types are in positive position, but function parameters are in what's called negative position. So length has an int in positive position and a list of A's in negative position. I've invented a function here called build Rome. It takes a Romulus and a Remus and produces Rome. <laughs> this function takes more than one day to run. <laughs> but Romulus and Remus are in negative position and Rome is in positive position, as it was in the ancient world. So, for f to be an instance of functor, every a in f of a must be in positive position. And if it is, we say that f is covariant in a. So in, in Haskell, when we see the type class functor, it, it, it really means a covariant functor as opposed to a contravariant functor. Right, so here's, here's maybe, so the, the a that occurs in maybe is here in positive position. So we can write a functor instance. What about this type? This is the type of endomorphisms on A or functions from A to A. So in this type, we have A occurring both in positive and in negative position, right? It's both a function parameter and return type. 
This thing is not a functor because A appears in both positive and negative position. We, or it's not a covariant functor. We say that endo is invariant in A. Uh, so back to our example of predicates. A predicate has an A which only occurs in negative position. So we say that predicate is contravariant in A. Okay? And now I've told you everything I need to tell you to introduce a contravariant functor. So a contravariant functor is a sort of a backwardsy looking fellow which says, given a function from B to A and an F of A, I will produce an F of B. Now, if I had shown you this slide at the beginning, you would have said, George, that's crazy. <laughs> I can't run a function backwards over my F. It doesn't work. And the reason that you'd come to that conclusion is you have a good intuition for covariant functors. And that intuition is sort of that they're they have some A's that we can play with. You know, we, we can get at some A's. But that, oh, and there are laws, good. Um, <laughs> you, you can sort of start to expect that with my slides. There's going to be some laws. Um, uh, so we think of a covariant functor as being full of A's. The intuition for a contravariant functor is that they consume A's, or they're, they're waiting for some A's. They want A's, right? Like a student. <laughs> so predicate is a contravariant functor. Given a function from B to A and a predicate on A's, I can produce a predicate on B's by just composing the function in there. And to show you this graphically, in another awful, awful diagram, if a predicate on A's is a thing that takes an A and produces either true or false, then I can compose in a function from B to A and get a, and this whole thing is now a predicate which takes a B and gives you either true or false. So by composing in a function from B to A, I have gone from a predicate on A's to a predicate on B's. Another contravariant functor that comes up a lot is comparisons. So an ordering between two elements is either less than, equal to, or greater than. And a comparison is a function which takes two things and produces the ordering between them. This is a comparison on A's. And this thing is also a contravariant functor, where we, um, we have a function and we sort of you know, stick it in there and the types line up and we're happy. Uh, yeah, so comparison is another contravariant functor. And there's this whole cool hierarchy of things under contravariant, just like with functor, right? After functor, we can learn about applicative and alternative and all these cool things. There are contravariant versions of applicative and alternative. So we have divisible and decidable in contravariant land, and they're all found in the contravariant package up on Hackage, if you want to check that out. That's a good package. Uh, and, you, and you might say, well, George, these things don't come up very often, contravariance, right? Like a predicate and ordering, that's cool. Why would I care? What has someone done that's good with these, you might ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll answer your question with another question. Have you ever sorted anything? Yeah? Sorted things? Yeah? I think we've all sorted things. Things need sorting. We sort them. Uh, how long did it take? Can I, can I hazard a guess it took n log n? <laughs> we can do better. So there's a library called discrimination up on Hackage for linear time sorting of things. Linear time. N. Yeah. And it's built, fundamentally built, out of contravariant functors and decidable and divisible type classes. It's really cool. It's a bunch of research by a guy called Fritz Henglein. And then uh, Edward Komet has tweaked it to play nicely with laziness and that kind of thing, I think. Um, but it's really cool. You can learn about that as well. I linked to a talk about it in the, at the end. So that's why you should care about contravariant. And you should start sorting things faster. Use Haskell. We sort things faster. Um, so now that we've talked about bifunctor and contravariant, we now have all the tools that we need to talk about profunctor. This is what I was trying to get to the whole time. All that other stuff, linear time sorting, nah, that's not even important. Profunctors, 
That's what we're about. What's a profunctor? <laughs> P is a profunctor if I can write this type, uh, this function dimap, which has the type, given a function from A to B and a function from C to D and a P B C produce a P A D, right? So this looks a bit like a bifunctor, right, with one key difference. A bifunctor is covariant in both of its type parameters. But a profunctor is <coughs> covariant in its right type parameter, but contravariant in its left type parameter. Right? Uh, and of course, as with bifunctors, we can, we can, so we can contramap on the left and we can map on the right independently of one another, or we can do, use dimap to do both at once. Um, who can guess what's coming up next? It's laws! <laughs> uh, they look like this. So a profunctor is a sort of a thing that it, it really wants some Bs, and it has some Cs that we can get at. And we can, we can contramap a function from A to B on this side, and we can... Uh, oh, don't go there. We can map a function from C to D on this side, and now this whole thing is like one big pipeline that sort of has an A on one end and a D on the other. And we can sort of keep building this pipeline out in both directions. So the sort of canonical example of profunctor is function arrow. Function arrow, right? So function arrow is a profunctor. And the type of dimap in the case of function arrow is given a function from A to B, and a function from C to D, and a function from B to C, produce a function from A to D. And we say, oh, that's easy, right? I just get the A, pass it to the function from A to B, get a B, pass it to the function from B to C, get a C, pass it for the front, uh, to the function from C to D, and now I have a D, and that's the answer. Simple. That was easy. All right, what about some other profunctors, right? It can't just be function arrow. If there were an abstraction that only covered function arrow, we'd call it function, right? <laughs> what are some other profunctors that come up? You might have come across this type, Kleisley, from control.arrow. So a Kleisley is a sort of a, it's a function-y thing that returns its result in some kind of monad. Um, and if M is a monad, in fact, then Kleisley of M is a profunctor. We can sort of map backwards on the input the same way we did with function, and if we sneak a lift M in there, we can map in the result. Okay? And... In fact, Kleisley isn't the only arrow that is a profunctor. Every arrow is a profunctor. Right? Uh, I will prove it. There, there you go. <laughs> uh, so arrow and profunctor are both part of the same sort of sub-hierarchy of this functor family. And I encourage you to go and learn about it because it's a really cool sub-hierarchy. Um, and you might say, well, George, oh, yeah, and they're in the profunctor package. Uh, on Hackage, go check that out. And you might say, well, George, why would I care about profunctors? Who cares? Sure, there are functions, and there are functions with monads in them. Who cares, right? Whatever. Why should you care about profunctors? Lens. <laughs> so in about an hour, Brian McKenna's going to give a talk on lenses. And now, when he says profunctor, you'll know what he's talking about. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, sweet, thank you. Any questions? I can't see any hands. Oh, there we go, there's one. Oh, there's one up there. Are you going with a mic, Noon? Yeah. Sweet. Were any of the packages you mentioned not written by Ed Komet? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ed sent me these stickers. <laughs> Um, I have some references here. There's, let's see, there's one Connor McBride, there's two Ed, and there's one Phil Freeman. So it's half Ed in the references as well. Anyone else? Right up the back there? Come up. Wait. <laughs> have you considered writing this up somewhere and putting it up and getting a lot of imaginary internet points for it. Because, like, 
I've never actually seen it laid out really well like that before. Um, so this talk, Fun with Profunctors, is sort of like a two and a half hour version of this talk um, that goes into all sorts of extra cool stuff that I don't even know about. So that's a good talk. Um, there is a, there's a blog article with a similar structure to this somewhere. Um, I think it's called Profunctors are Fun or Fun with Profunctors that reads sort of this way. Um, I don't know. I learned these things from Tony Morris in the pub. Uh, <laughs> that and in the hallway with Edward Komet are my two favorite methods of learning things. So I'm not much help there. Yeah. Type Classopedia by Brent Yorgi. It starts with a similar diagram to the one I started with. Yeah. Oh, cool. I did have one little just final question. So if I grokked all of that, which is highly debatable, um, you had the bifunctor that was covariant in both of its function arguments, and you had the proto profunctor, sorry, that was yep. covariant in one and contravariant in the other. Yeah. Is there an example of a type class that's contravariant in both of its function arguments? Um, Pick two contravariant functors and put them next to each other and give that a type and that thing is contravariant in What's both. that called? Uh, I don't know. It, it'll have a really stupid name. Post conf functor. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. We probably have time for one more. Cool. No? All good? Round of applause, I think. <laughs>